Hey, 42 here. You know that feeling when all you want to do is dive into the dark, forbidding ocean off an island in the middle of nowhere and look for sharks? No, me neither. But for Kirakiro Arataki, that was a good day out. In 1986, this resident of Yonaguni Jima, a tiny sliver of land off the coast of Taiwan in the East China Sea, went scuba diving to the south of the island, looking for the best place to observe the hammerhead sharks known to congregate there in large numbers. But what he found instead was something much, much more interesting. Peering into the depths, he glimpsed a towering mass of stone, rising almost 30 meters from the ocean floor. But it wasn't the monolith's size that caught Arataki's attention. No, it was the fact that it appeared to be man-made. He rushed back to land and returned a short while later with a team of scientists headed by Professor Masaki Kimura, a marine geologist from the nearby University of Ryokyu. Initially, Kimura believed the formation could be natural. But after the first dive, he was convinced he was looking at the remains of a giant stepped pyramid, part of an unknown city from antiquity. In subsequent dives, a geologist mapped the full 45,000 square meters of the monolith, identifying remnants of what he believed were once a castle, five temples, an entranceway, roads, drainage channels, public meeting spaces, and a stadium. He also claimed to have found carvings in the rock that proved human occupation, words in some unknown language, as well as crude carvings of animals and faces. Kimura estimated the structure to have been about 10,000 years old, dating it back to a time when it still would have been above water. That was towards the end of the last ice age, during the slow thaw that took place between 19,000 and 6,000 years ago, a period during which global sea levels rose by about 120 meters. Of course, if it really was 10,000 years old, the Yonaguni Monument, as Arataki's discovery is now known, would have been constructed a full 5,000 years before the Egyptians built the pyramids, which led Kimura to an even more astonishing conclusion, that the monument off the coast of Yonaguni Island was the last remains of the fabled continent of Mu. A word of caution to any budding archaeologists out there, if you're trying to build professional credibility, it might be best to avoid basing any of your theories on the existence of a magical kingdom that supposedly sank into the sea. That kind of thing doesn't tend to come across well in job interviews. Anyway, in case you've never heard of it, the land of Mu is basically Atlantis, but in the Pacific Ocean instead of the Atlantic. The myth began in the 19th century with archaeologist Augustus Le Plongeon. He was known for his studies of Maya ruins in Mexico. He claims to have translated an ancient Maya text called the Popol Vuh, which he said proved the Maya civilization predated those of Greece and Egypt. He also said the book revealed the existence of an even older continent that he connected with the legend of Atlantis. He called the lost continent Mu, and named it as the source of the Mayan and Egyptian civilizations. But it was his successor, a man by the name of James Churchwood, who would take things to a whole Mu level. According to Churchwood, whilst he was a soldier stationed in India, he earned the trust of a temple priest who showed him ancient clay tablets inscribed with a forgotten language. Once he'd managed to decipher the tablets, Churchwood realized they contained information about the lost continent of Mu, which had once sustained an advanced civilization called the Narkal. Bigger than South America, Mu was apparently home to the Garden of Eden, more than 64 million people, and was the birthplace of the great civilizations of Egypt, Greece, Central America, India, Burma, and even Easter Island. Sadly, the entire 5,000 by 3,000 mile landmass disappeared one night after a series of catastrophic earthquakes and volcanic eruptions caused the continent to disintegrate and sink beneath the waves. 
most inconvenient. Beyond the fact that it's about a place called Mu, described in an extinct language written on tablets that nobody has set eyes on except the guy who's telling the story, the myth is hard to believe because it has absolutely no scientific evidence to support it. The theory of plate tectonics, which has been well established since the 1970s, pretty much rules out the possibility of lost continents. And even if one had been submerged by an incomprehensible natural disaster, we should still be able to find it today. Zealandia, for example, is a massive piece of continental crust that broke away from the supercontinent Gondwanaland around 80 million years ago. It eventually sank, but pieces of the landmass still stick out above the surface of the ocean as islands. We call the biggest of these New Zealand. Zealandia is almost big enough to be considered a continent. In fact, there are campaigns underway to have it recognised as such, and it's pretty easy to spot using modern technology. So it's fair to assume that Mu, which was apparently more than seven times bigger than Zealandia, wouldn't be hard to find, even if it really had been swallowed up by the Pacific Ocean. Given all these facts, it's not hard to see why the scientific community didn't exactly jump at Professor Kumara's claims that the Yanaguni Monument might be the last pieces of the lost land of Mu. That didn't, however, mean there wasn't something unique about this submerged formation. In 1997, the first expedition to Yonaguni was organised by a Japanese businessman with the aim of uncovering the underwater structure's secrets. He invited a few camera crews and a team of international archaeology experts that included John Anthony West, Graham Hancock and Robert Schock. Well, I say experts, this wasn't exactly a crew of Nobel Prize winning scientists. West and Hancock are prolific writers in what is widely regarded as pseudo-archaeology, and whilst their theories of ancient civilizations have enjoyed broad popularity, neither is credited with any formal archaeological education. Schock, meanwhile, is actually an associate professor of natural sciences at Boston University, with degrees in geology and geophysics from Yale. But despite his academic record, he's best known for a fringe theory he developed with John Anthony West regarding the Great Sphinx of Giza. The pair claim the Sphinx shows evidence of water erosion due to rain, which they believe makes the statue much older than is conventionally believed. Instead of being about 4,500 years old and built for Khafre, a pharaoh of Egypt's fourth dynasty, the Sphinx would be 5,000 to 10,000 years old, and the work of a much older and more advanced civilization. This is a controversial view, to put it lightly. Shock is also known for his belief that all the pyramids across the globe may have originated from a central civilization that existed in Sunderland, which I thought was a small city in the northeast of England, but is apparently a continent sized stretch of land in Southeast Asia between 6,000 and 8,000 years ago. Since this is long before the agreed date that civilization began on Earth, the theory hasn't been very popular amongst fellow archaeologists. Fairly or unfairly, these unconventional beliefs have also seen shock branded with accusations of pseudoscience. So, it was a bit of a blow when he visited the Yonaguni Monument in 1997 and concluded it was most likely a natural rock formation. When the pseudoscientists think you're talking nonsense, you're usually in trouble. The monolith is cut from one massive piece of stone. It isn't made of blocks or bricks, as is more common with man-made structures, but it does, from some angles, look remarkably similar to a ziggurat, a stepped temple tower common in Mesopotamia between 4,000 and 2,500 years ago. Like the Yonaguni example, ziggurats had no internal chambers and were usually square or rectangular with multiple steps and levels. A famous example being the ziggurat terraces that formed the foundation of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which are one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. 
if they actually existed, that is. Nobody seemed completely sure on that point. Amongst the most mysterious characteristics of the Yonaguni structure are the dramatically clean lines of the steps and corners, which simply look too perfect to not be man-made. But Shock says the shapes aren't as regular as many people claim, and that some misleading camera work is to blame for the confusion. From some angles, Yonaguni really does look like some kind of sunken ancient palace, but from others, it looks like a big pile of rocks on the ocean floor. He also maintains the clear cuts can be attributed to natural geological forces. And if you've ever visited the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland, you'll know random geological forces can get pretty creative when they put their mind to it. The rock formation at Yonaguni is made from sandstone and mudstone, which are known to fracture in very clean straight lines. And similar patterns of erosion can be found not too far away on land in the form of wide, sharp-cut terraces. According to Shock, the large number of earthquakes experienced in the region might have amplified the effect of breaks along cracks and fissures in the rock. And the incredibly strong ocean currents around the monolith could have accounted for the exaggerated erosion patterns including the marks on the rocks Kumora believed to be in ancient writing or pictures. Another blow to Kumora's theory came when a submerged cave system was found near the monument. As you probably know, stalactites are formed by the action of water dripping from the ceiling of the cave, leaving behind microscopic deposits which accumulate over millennia which means stalactites can only form in caves that are above ground. So, if you find stalactites in a cave system under the ocean, they can be dated to give you a precise point in history when the cave was last on dry land. And when stalactites in the submerged cave systems near the Yonaguni monument were dated, they were found to be far younger than Kimura's original age for the monument of 10,000 years. Not that Kimura was particularly bothered with this revelation. When faced with evidence that didn't quite fit his narrative, he simply tweaked his story suggesting a massive earthquake about 2,000 years ago could have caused the land to fracture, tilt, and then slide into the sea. He also suggests these dates will correspond to the proposed time of Yamatai, an ancient country that predates Japan, but the location of which has been debated hotly for decades by Japanese scholars and archaeologists. Because hey, he wasn't going to miss the opportunity to throw yet another mystery into the mix. Whether or not Yonaguni really is man-made, it seems safe to assume the last time it was on land, local humans would have been drawn to it. From Uluru in Australia to the oddly shaped sandstone butts of Monument Valley, we humans have always been fascinated by unusual stone monoliths. Which is why some people have suggested our ancestors almost certainly used Yonaguni in one way or another. Admittedly, the site doesn't exhibit the kind of archaeological detail found at other submerged sites like Atlit Yam in Israel. This ancient Neolithic village off the coast of the Mediterranean Sea may not have been a major civilization, but it has been carbon dated to between 8,300 and 8,900 years old, and contains features like remains of rectangular houses, a stone circle with megaliths, a five meter deep well, human skeletons, arrowheads, and axes. I'm not saying it's a competition, but none of these signs of entrenched human settlement have been found at Yonaguni, of course, this may well be due to the intense ocean activity at Yonaguni, created by the competing forces of the Pacific Ocean and the East China Sea, as well as the regular typhoons and massive waves found there. In fact, the largest tsunami ever recorded, a 40 meter high monster, hit Yonaguni in 1771. So, is the Yonaguni monolith the remains of an ancient and advanced civilization? just a bunch of weird rocks on the ocean floor, or some kind of combination of the two. The truth is, nobody really knows for sure, and thanks to the relentless savagery of the ocean, 
Even if an ancient civilization did build Yanaguni, there's unlikely to be enough evidence left to prove it. Admittedly, the natural geological causes hypothesis is probably favourable at this point, but as is the case with most of the world's great mysteries, at the end of the day, people will still believe whatever they want to believe. But it's safe to say Kimura and his supporters are going to need to conjure up some more convincing evidence that the structure is man-made before the wider scientific community will be willing to believe the former. Not that it matters, because as is usually the case with these things, people will see what they want to see. So big block of eroded sandstone, or the last remains of a mystical ancient paradise claimed by the ocean's depths. You decide. Thanks for watching. You can get your hands on my book, Stick a Flag in It, over on Amazon or on Audible. Links to both in the description below. Thank you.